the poverty we see in our community, and I say this a lot, was recent and learned behavior. When our ancestors weren't poor, we were taught to be poor. But like anything that you're taught, you can unlearn too. So it became like, well, how do I unlearn this? Well, how do I find a way to restore, you know, that sense of purpose, that sense of connection? He comes from an ohana of cultural practitioners who turn to the wisdom of the past to create a better future for their struggling communities. Kamuela Enos, next on Long Story Short. One-on-one, -on -one, engaging conversations with some of Hawaii's most intriguing people. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox. Aloha mai kako, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Kamuela Enos is the Director of Social Enterprise at Ma'o Organic Farms in Wai'anae, Oahu, a low-income area where he offers internships to teenagers and young adults. They work on the farms in exchange for a stipend and college tuition assistance. After a few stumbles of his own, Enos found his path to his calling in life, serving others while perpetuating Hawaiian ancestral responsibilities. Kamuela was born into the Enos Ohana of Wai'anae. His father, Eric Enos, is a cultural practitioner and activist who co-founded Ka'ala Farms years before Ma'o with a similar mission to heal at-risk youth by having them connect with their roots. I knew it was special. I think part of what I think the reality was is to be raised in a family that was doing something that was in front of a curve. Meaning? That I think my father was Eric Enos, one of the founders of Ka'ala Farms, um, was doing Aina work, restoring traditional practices in what is now an actual industry, it's a thing, Aina-based education, right? It was born out of this idea of reclaiming land and identity as a response to the Hawaiian Renaissance, of having had that part of our identity kind of been told explicitly to step away from. You know, it's important for you to assimilate into contemporary American society and to, you know, be a good American and to take all the vestiges of, vestiges of your ancestry, your language, your practices, and put that behind you. When did your father start reclaiming the land? You know, I think he really was, I remember that because I was really young and he you know, was from Wai'anae. He went to Kamehameha schools and then he got into, um, he went to actually, he went to college. And going to college at UH in the late 60s, early 70s, you can only imagine like colleges across the campus were really, you know, that was the heart of the civil rights movement. and the birthplace of the Hawaiian Renaissance too, when people were told it's, you started actually learning your history and realizing that we weren't getting, we weren't understanding, our, we weren't allowed to understand our ancestry from a place of strength. Mm -hmm. He was coming of age and he was heavily radicalized and he got a job teaching at Wai'anae High School. But he got a chance to really see it from how I understand it, his stories. He's one of the few men was of Hawaiian ancestry from the community actually teaching. And he was able to hear how teachers were talking about kids from Wai'anae. So he often tells me like he had to quit or he would have been arrested. <laughs> he was so angry at the messaging. And just like the disregard, I mean the blatant racism mm. that he saw behind the scenes. And then he took up work with, uh, with an organization that worked directly with at-risk youth. And it was from that point that it's called the Rap Center, um, where he began to take students, young adults actually, not students, that are kind of out of the system, hanging out at the beach parks, walking in the mountains, to kind of get them away from where they would just hang out and associate and do all the things that were leading to their delinquency, back up into, into the mountains to kind of understand. Take them out of there environment and put him in a new environment and there he started seeing all the remnants of the taro patches. How did he come to acquire the land? That's a really interesting question. I think back in the 70s it was just like, you know what, we're just gonna clear this place out, bring water down and reclaim it. And if people don't like it then they can come and talk to us. Was it abandoned land? Who, who owned it? 
It was in the back of the valley and... Probably state-owned? State-owned land. And they just decided to have these youth repurpose their time at this. <laughs> I don't know what they were supposed to be doing, but what they ended up doing was cutting, clearing out Haolikoa and putting in PVC pipes and bringing water back down. And then learning from people um, on the east side of Oahu who are still doing traditional taro farming, like how do we grow this? And I think that was a really important thing for me to understand. It was like, he wasn't just growing, trying to reclaim ability to grow food, but he was trying to reclaim the ability to grow people and therefore the ability to regrow community. You know, I was raised in a context of growing up with an activist parent where I think the things he was doing, none of my peers that my, like I grew up with, their parents did. Mm -hmm. My mother was always very much a fan of reading and a big fan of education, so she would just make us read. So we had our noses buried in Tolkien when we were like fourth grade, and then we just reading Albert Camus in seventh grade, and she just said, read, read, read. So kind of like a, um, embracing like intellectualism, if you yeah, will. So body and mind. But then also growing up as a Waianae boy. <laughs> and just going to all the public schools, Macaw Elementary, Waianae Intermediate, um, in a high school where I eventually dropped out. And like, I call it the blessed schizophrenia of trying to reconcile these three separate, completely different worlds, right? And okay, the three worlds were? Like the restoring, I mean, being part of restoring our ancestral practices and mm -hmm. being immersed in um, not just tarot farming, but community organizing. Okay, that's one. The other was um, like just having a love of reading and especially um, like not just reading to escape but authors that really help you understand like more philosophical bent right people who really provoked your the thought provocative thinking um, and the third the third was being having the people I grew up with and like who were my best friends who I love to this day really living in the realities of poverty as good as wonderful people they are like their daily lives was really bounded by struggling to make ends meet mm -hmm. and all of the things that um, happen when you live in that context with the violence, the drug use, the alcohol, you know, and like those three realities kind of didn't sit well with each other, especially as I got older and my peers became more and more who I identified with and I started to reject the other two a little bit more. That kind of was took a while to, to weave those, those two strands back together <laughs> into something. Is that where you dropped out of high school? Basically. Um, I think part of it was the school wasn't challenging enough for me, and second, I had a pretty poor attitude about things, so I wouldn't put it all in the system. I was really kind of, I don't know, I just felt disconnected. And non-air conditioned, why didn't I roam and learn about something? Mm -hmm. And have them fit into the system versus how do we flex the system to meet them where they're strong and, and take those strengths and have them from a strengths perspective then move into like, okay, now I gotta sit in a classroom because I'm passionate about this versus you're stupid, you don't know how to sit in a classroom. She also brought air conditioning to her media classes. Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> and what age did you drop out? Dropped out when I was 16, mm -hmm. 15. I started drinking when I was like in freshman. But we really started in earnest when I was 16 and dropping out and just hanging out with all my friends and some people I love to this day and I just realized um, you know we were all doing that together as a way to lift each other up it was a fun that was really volatile they became unfun really quickly did you get in true. did it get bad sometimes to result but in people getting hurt it's always the case in why um, but to me, it became something to reflect on. Because um, it's not just the thing that happens in our communities, it happens in communities all over, right? right? How people respond to historical traumas and, how, and what, op what vehicles and mediums are there for them to medicate. So do you think you and your friends were, didn't know it, but you were feeling the effects of 
historical trauma oh, yeah. of feeling dislocated and absolutely un unseen. Right. Yeah, and you know, if you're not given a platform, you make one. And our platform. Was, and you can make a bad platform oh, you as could, well as you a good make one. A heck of a bad platform. <laughs> Kamuela Enos's parents did not insist that he return to high school after dropping out during his senior year. However, they required two things. He had to earn a general education diploma, or GED, and he needed to get a job. Kamuela did so, working minimum wage jobs after picking up his GED from Waipahu High School. And there was this older Japanese guy who was handing out the G diplomas, kind of just looked at me and he was like, what are you doing? I was like, what? He was like, what are you doing? You shouldn't be in this line. And he was just like staring at me. And I was like, okay, did, did he know you? He didn't know me from Adam, but he could see the test scores. I was like, everyone here is struggling. You shouldn't be in this line. And I was like, okay. They're like, I went from like, I'm going to celebrate getting my GED to it was a long and reflective drive home to Y and I was like, what am I doing? Why am I in this line, right? And then that was further reinforced <laughs> when I started. The only jobs I could get was like working you know, at the fast food restaurants and different places where, you know, people hardly bother to remember your name as staff. And it's just, you're not there as a calling, you're there because you have to be. And that, what that really lifted up for me was the time I spent in Ka'ala with my dad. And that's when everything made sense. Like, we're working in a place where we were caring for land. We were making a lot of money, but we had a sense of purpose. You know, I had a sense of love for what I did. And it was at that point that I realized the value. Then things came back around. It was like, you know, not only was I unhappy in the jobs I was doing, but more importantly, I felt a lot of people I was working with was unhappy. And I felt like I want to do something about this dynamic. And then what do you do about it? You go to college and you drop out of college because <laughs> you, <feel like>, you <laughs> realize that you aren't prepared to go to college. And then, you know, I, I was lucky enough to have a partner at the time where she basically gave me an ultimatum. You're going to go to college or you, we're not going to be a couple. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so she had a diploma. I mean, she had a degree, so I went to college and I was supported. And that was the first, um, when, I took, when I went to college, I, I took a Hawaiian studies class. It was from Glenn Keela. He was teaching Hawaiian studies at Leeward Community College, Waianae. Um, and my brain just broke open. I was actually learning things I was really interested in. I was learning from a person who respected me as a learner. And I was learning in a space where I could see myself doing this for the rest of my life. And doing that, what? Learning or what? Being part of like, making a living, getting a living wage, being engaged with understanding how our heritage, how our ancestry is being deployed in a contemporary way that helps others. Does that mean you wanted to be a teacher? Or did you see another way to do that? I still didn't know, but I knew like, I loved, um, I loved learning about my culture, but I also loved trying to apply it. Mm -hmm. And not just learning about it as a museum piece, but then watching my father and the work that he was doing with Antipunani Burgess of trying to create jobs out of ancestral thinking. So you're, so you're going step by step, not really having a direction, but kind of following the, the clues as you go along. Yeah. I think your ancestors, and responding. your ancestors leave you clues that you have to pick up. Kind of always, nuggets along the way. Sometimes it's a hug, sometimes it's a swift kick in the butt. Um, but I think that when you follow the work, you, you know when you're in the right. I believe your ancestors live in your intuition. And like, there is something there that's telling you, this is what you're supposed to be doing. You know, <clears throat> if you... It, in those moments, you have to listen to that. Like his father before him, Kamuela Enos went on to earn his bachelor's degree in Hawaiian studies from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. After contemplating several career paths, he decided to focus on a master's degree in urban and regional planning. It led him to his true calling and eventually back to Waianae. Well, you know, I was really lucky when I was getting my master's program that 
like as I mentioned, I was um, took a class from Bob Agris, who was then the executive director of HackBid, the Hawaii Alliance for Community-Based Economic Development, and um, that nonprofit was a network organization that was basically created out of this idea that Auntie Punani Burgess and others, like my dad, had pushed on, like how do communities develop their own economic engines? Like how are we not dependent on outside jobs that quite often don't pay us well and, and don't, aren't maybe the best fit for our environment? Um, how instead of fighting those types of development, how do we be developers of our own jobs? Um, and Hackbed was, they had asked Bob Agris and they had asked to help him, they had asked him to help create this organization that helped practitioners across the state wrestle with that question. And I was lucky enough to um, be in classes where that was really found my love and I was interned at Hackbed for a while and I began to see that um, I really want to be at the intersect of how we create jobs in, in using our ancestral thinking so that we're creating powerful opportunities for employment. And Did you know what that looked like at the time? I'd watched my dad try to do that. I mean, oh. that's what Kaala and was trying to do. They had backyard aquaculture programs where they would have families raise um, tilapia in their backyards. I remember so. there was a time, was it in the 80s, when yeah. practically yeah. everybody had a tarp and a... Um, yeah, and, and an a, aquaculture. And yeah. like, that was an attempt to kind of look at an ancestral practice of fish ponds or mm -hmm. fellow fisheries and have people do it in their backyard as a way to generate revenue. Um, and I was really fascinated by the idea. Um, I've, and I was able to work at Hackbed, and you know, my younger brother Solomon is one of the founders of Mao. He's the first intern. So I was always tracking what they were doing. So right around the time I was finishing up my class, a position opened up. I was working at this other organization called Empower Oahu with Richard Pizzullo, uh, and it was, came out of the, um, the easy economic zone initiatives that under, I guess, the Clinton administration, where they gave money to communities to be able to start up um, economic empowerment zones. So me and Richard was working there, but then a position opened up at Mao as an ed education specialist. And I was like, oh, I really feel that like this is a time to come back to my community because I had been living in town for 10 years while I got my bachelor's and my master's. And as much as I loved Manoa, I was getting homesick. I really felt like I wanted to be back where I could be directly um, engaged in giving, like working with my own community. And it's an opportunity to grow our ability to, to, to be strong again. So I took it and I was working there for 10 years. and. While I was doing that, I'd continue um, to be helping Bob Agris every once in a while in the classes, teaching at the Department of Urban and Regional Planning. I, I love both the Hawaiian Studies Department and the Urban and Regional Planning Department and the Community College as an organization, um, as an institution, because those three places really allowed me to learn who I was and how I served best. And it's so interesting that it, it's not it's not like you suddenly see your future open up. I mean, you're you you are following, you know, the, the, the clues along the way, listening for the the sounds in the forest, kind of. You're getting slaps in the head when I step out. Of line. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I think that's, yeah, I think that's really. It's never about us. I think it's always about how people guide us, and like, you know, we have to learn how to humble ourselves to the fact that we're put on paths and. Kicking and screaming and resenting it is part of it at times. <laughs> it's like, oh, or taking the wrong path. Taking the, taking wrong, the wrong path. <laughs> it's really, you know, I think there is no straight path. My dad used to always tell me, you gotta walk the crooked path straight. It's like, it's not a clearly laid out path for you. Kamuela Enos walked the crooked path straight back to Waianae, where he felt he could best serve the community through his work at Ma'o Organic Farms, an organization that provides college tuition assistance to area students in exchange for their work on the farms. When people hear your title, I think that many people, and including me, are not quite sure of what it means. You're the Director of Social Enterprise <laughs> at Ma'o Farms. I know, right? That's the cool thing about running your own business, you can make whatever titles you want. <laughs> 
<laughs> but I think, to me, it's the idea of social enterprise is we measure two things on a daily basis in our farm. It's the sales of our product and the GPAs of our students. And all the revenue from the farm doesn't go to staff. It goes back into the mission of the program. And the mission is to make sure that our land is productive again and the people who are working in the land are empowered. And that's, to me, a really important narrative. When it, people talk about what does it mean to be a native Hawaiian business, to me it doesn't mean that people have Hawaiian DNA or running a business. To me it means that to create a product or a service for a society without externalizing the cost on people or land. Because our ancestors did that. That was how they ran in Ahupua. They were the first social entrepreneurs. They were able to create tons and tons of kalo, tons and tons of fish without exploiting people or diminishing the land's carrying capacity. That's how Ahupua's work. So I feel that's why it's really impo important to root our practices in ancestral thinking. And that's why the two things we track on a daily basis, the sales and the GPAs, that's what our ancestors tracked. And I believe our makuhiki ceremony where the chiefs would come and look at the fitness of land, I mean abundance of land and fitness of people, those two measures, those two metrics, are the same metrics that we've translated into sales and GPAs. The sales of our product is our land is abundant again. The GPAs is our people are fit. I mean, it's not a full measure, of course, and there's other things we're trying to add into it. Like, But those are the recognized, uh, grade point average is the recognized college It was a year standard. reporting to your chief. Like, that's what our ancestors did when they came in and checked out, the chief came and checked on his, his or her um, people, they say, How are my people fit? Is the land productive? My responsibility is to have that happen. Mm -hmm. So if we create our businesses that emanate from that same idea, that I can say the programs that we're running is ensuring that not only is food being grown, but it's being grown organically. And the difference in organic production is that you care about the soil's regenerative health over annual yields. What's more important is that the future generations have the right to grow that soil um, from that soil. So that means that we're generating revenue in ways that's caring for the soil specifically, and that the farmer is not someone that's getting a minimum wage with no upward mobility. Like they're using this opportunity to pay for their college, which for some people is a pathway out of their community, but I want to focus that as a pathway back into your community as a person who has a degree now that can advocate. You know, if you're given a gift, you better make sure that you are using it to help others. And to me as a parent now, like, I wrestle with, like, with n n doing the work that I do now, knowing all the challenges environmentally, economically, mm -hmm. socially, politically that we're facing. Like, you know, how do, what kind of things am I asked to set up for my grandchildren so that they can thrive in climate change? thrive in all these different things that are happening and then be a part of changing it and recalibrating it. So I did want to acknowledge that, you know, we do what we do because of people invest in us. And they're real clear, I mean, more than invest, like at their own expense and in provide incredible sacrifice so that we can thrive, right? So when you work with youth and land, then you're kind of creating a breaking point in generations of poverty and you, you're with them authentically, working alongside them, then they actually begin a chance to have a clear that space to actually see their To worth. see things differently. Yeah, and, and to apply the things that they learn and see a future for themselves. Mm -hmm. That for me, the big thing I always think about is I had a really rare childhood. And that what I just stay awake at night thinking about is how do I make the childhood I had available to as many students as possible where you are able to um, have a deep sense of what your ancestors did in a place from a strength perspective. And you have your own children now too. I have two children. I have an eight-year-old and a five-year-old who I love dearly. And like, to me, the like, fact that I can kind of replicate that experience for them, but also give them more agency in helping to, they can say what they like about it too. And they can give input is really exciting. One of the joys I get in the work that I do now in Ma'o is, which really drives me, it's the same joy I think my father had when he was doing Ka'ala, is I get to show up and go to work every day in what people would consider, have considered impossible. 
I get to go to a job where young adults from Waianae are running the largest organic farm on the island while getting a 2.0 in college. If you would ask people 15 years ago we were going to do that, they would have told you, you are crazy. There's no way that the largest organic farm on Oahu is going to be in Waianae, much less that kids from Waianae are going to work there, much less kids from Waianae are going to work there as college students maintaining a 2.0. That is impossible. So the fact that I get to work every day in a space of what other people consider impossible really helps me think that things that people are saying are impossible now can be possible. In 2010, President Obama recognized the work of Kamuela Enos and appointed him as a member of his advisory commission on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. Kamuela says he'll continue to live by the examples of his ancestors while keeping a focus on modern day problems like climate upheaval and the health and wealth disparities of his community. Mahalo to Kamuela Enos of YPO and Waianae O'ahu. And thank you for joining us for this edition of Long Story Short on PBS Hawaii. I'm Leslie Wilcox. Aloha nui. For audio and written transcripts of all episodes of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, visit pbshawaii.org. To download free podcasts of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, go to the Apple iTunes Store or visit pbshawaii.org. When you work with youth and land, then you're kind of creating a breaking point in generations of poverty. And you, you're with them authentically, working alongside them. Then they actually begin a chance to have a clear that space to actually see their to work. To see things differently. Yeah, and, and to apply the things that they learn and see a future for themselves.